Fourth Adventure, Part Two of Master Flea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Master Flea by E. T. A. Hoffman. Fourth Adventure, Part Two. On returning to his house, he was surprised by a strange spectacle. A man stood in the middle of the passage, looking steadfastly through a strangely formed glass at Mr. Schwammer's door. Upon this door sun-bright circles played in rainbow colors, and then met in one fiery point that seemed to pierce through the wood. As this took place, a deep sighing was heard broken by cries of pain which came as it appeared from the room. To his horror Peregrine fancied that he distinguished Gamaheh's voice. "'What do you want? What are you doing here?' he exclaimed to the man, who really seemed to be practising diabolic arts, the rainbow circles growing with every moment quicker and brighter, the centre point piercing more keenly, and the cries sounding more painfully from the chamber. Oh! exclaimed the stranger, closing his glass and hastily putting it into his pocket. Oh, the landlord! Your pardon, my dear sir, that I am operating here without your permission. I did indeed pay you a visit to request it, but Alina told me you had gone out, and the business here would admit of no delay. What business? said Peregrine, pretty harshly. What business is it that will admit of no delay? "'Don't you know,' replied the stranger, with an odious grin, "'don't you know that my ill-advised niece, Dorcha Elverdink, has run away? "'You were arrested, though with great injustice, as her seducer, "'on which score I will with great pleasure testify your perfect innocence, "'if it should be requisite. "'It is not to you, but to Schwammerdam, once my friend, and now my enemy, that the faithless Dorcha has fled. She is in that chamber, I know it, and alone, since Schwammerdam has gone out. I cannot get in, as the door is barred and bolted, and I am too mild to employ force. But I have taken the liberty to torment her a little with my optical glass, that she may know I am her lord and master in spite of her imaginary princessship. "'You are the devil!' exclaimed Peregrine, in the highest indignation. "'You are the devil, but not lord and master of the beautiful Gamahe. Out of my house! Practice your devil's tricks where you will, but here you will fail with them, I can promise you. Don't put yourself in a passion, my dear Mr. Tees. I am an innocent man who mean nothing but good.' It is a little monster, a little basilisk, that sits in yonder room in the shape of a lovely woman. If the abode, with my insignificance, displeased her, she might have fled. But the traitress should not have robbed me of my most precious treasure, the best friend of my soul, without whom I am nothing. She should not have run away with Master Flea. You will not understand what I mean, worthy sir. But here Master Flea, who had planted himself in a secure place, could not refrain from bursting out into a fine mocking laugh. Ha! cried Leuwenhoek, struck with a sudden terror. Ha! What was that? Can it be possible? Here, on this spot? Uh, permit me, my dear sir. Thus saying, Leuwenhoek stretched out his hand and snatched at Peregrine's collar who dexterously avoided his grasp, and, seizing him with a strong arm, dragged him towards the door to fling him out without further ado. But just as he had reached the door, it was opened from without, and in rushed George Pepusch, followed by Schwammerdam. No sooner did Leuwenhoek perceive his enemy Schwammerdam than he burst from Peregrine with the utmost exertion of his last strength and planted himself with his back against the door of the mysterious chamber, where the fair one was imprisoned. Schwammerdam, 
seeing this, took a little telescope from his pocket, drew it out at full length, and fell upon his adversary, exclaiming, "'Draw, scoundrel, if you have courage!' Leuvenhoek had quickly a similar instrument in his hand, drew it out as the other had done, and cried, "'Come on, I am ready, and you will soon feel my prowess!' Each now put his glass to his eye, and fell furiously upon the other with sharp, murderous glances, now lengthening and now shortening his weapon by drawing the tubes in and out. There were feints, parries, thrusts, in short, all the tricks of the fencing school, and with every moment they seemed to grow more angry. Whenever one was hit, he cried out aloud, sprang into the air, cut the most wonderful capers, made the most beautiful entrechats, and turned pirouettes, as well as the best pas de seul dancer on the Parisian stage, till his adversary fixed him fast with the shortened telescope. When the other was hit, he did precisely the same, and in this way they went on interchangeably with the most violent springs, the maddest gestures, and the most furious cries. The perspiration dropped from their brows, the blood-red eyes seemed starting from their heads, and as there appeared no other cause for their St. Vitus dance than their looking at each other through their glasses, they might have been taken from maniacs, just escaped from the madhouse. For the rest, it was a very pretty sight. Schwammerdam at last succeeded in driving Leuvenhoek from his post by the door, which she had maintained with obstinate bravery and thus carrying on the war in the remoter parts of the ground. George Pepouge saw the opportunity, pressed against the unoccupied door that was neither barred nor bolted, and slipped into the chamber. But in the next moment he rushed out, exclaiming, "'She has fled! Fled!' and then hurried out of the house with the rapidity of lightning. Both Leuvenhoek and Schwammerdam were seriously wounded, for both hopped and danced about after a mad fashion, and with their howlings and cryings made a music to it that seemed like the shrieks of the damned in hell. Peregrine knew not how to set about separating them, and thus ending a contest which was as ludicrous as it was terrific. At last the combatants perceived that the door stood wide open, forgot their duel and their pains, put their destructive weapons into their pockets, and rushed into the chamber. Mr. Tees took it grievously to heart that the fair one had fled from his house, and wished the abominable Leuvenhoek at the devil, when the voice of Alina was heard upon the stairs. She was laughing aloud, and muttered between, oh, "'What strange things one does see! Wonderful! Incredible!' "'What!' cried Peregrine dejectedly. "'What wonder has happened now?' "'Oh, my dear Mr. Tease!' exclaimed the old woman. "'Only come upstairs directly, and go into your chamber.' And she opened the room door with a cunning titter. On entering, "'Oh, wonder! Oh, joy!' the little Dorcha Elverdink tripped up to him in her dress of tissue, as he had before seen her at Mr. Schwammer's. "'Ah!' Oh. "'At length I see you again,' said the little one, and contrived to nestle up so closely to Peregrine that he could not help embracing her most tenderly, in spite of all his good resolutions. His senses seemed ecstasied by love and joy. It has often happened to a man that in the height of his transports he has hit his nose somewhat roughly and being suddenly awakened out of his heaven by the earthly pain, has tumbled down again into the vulgar world. Just so it chanced with our Mr. Tease. In stooping down to kiss Dorcha's sweet mouth, he gave his nose, of goodly dimensions, a hard blow against the diadem of shining brilliance which the little one wore in her raven locks. The pain of the blow upon the sharp points of the stone brought him sufficiently to himself to perceive the diadem. The diadem reminded him of the Princess Gamahe, and with this recollection recurred all that Master Flea had told him of the little siren. He bethought himself that a princess, the daughter of a mighty king, 
could not possibly care about his love, and therefore all her pretended affection must be a mere trick, by which the dissembler hoped to regain possession of Master Flea. With this consideration, a cold ice stream seemed to rush through his veins, which, if it did not quite extinguish, at least damped the love flame. Peregrine gently freed himself from the arms of the little one, who had lovingly embraced him, and said, with downcast eyes, "'Oh, heavens! You are the daughter of the mighty king Sekakas, the beautiful Kamahe. Your pardon, princess, if a feeling, which I could not master, hurried me into folly, into madness. But yourself, lady, what are you saying, my dear friend?' interrupted Dorje Elverdink. "'I, the daughter of a mighty king? I, a princess? I am your Alina, who will love you to distraction if you—' "'But how is this? Alina, the queen of Golconda? She is already with you. I have spoken with her. A good, kind woman, but she has grown old.' and is no longer so handsome as in the time of her marriage with the French general. Oh, woe is me! I am not the right one. I never ruled in Golconda. Woe is me! The little one had closed her eyes and began to totter. Peregrine conveyed her to a sofa. Gamahe, she went on, speaking in a state of sonambulism. Gamahe? do you say? Kamahe, the daughter of King Sekakis. <sighs> yes, I recollect, in Famagusta. I was indeed a beautiful tulip. Yet no, even then I felt desire and love in my breast. Still, on that point. She was silent, and seemed to be falling into a perfect slumber. Peregrine undertook the perilous enterprise of placing her in a more convenient position, but, as he gently embraced her, a concealed pin pricked him sharply in the finger. According to his custom, he snapped his fingers, and Master Flea, taking it for the concerted signal, immediately placed the microscopic glass in his eye. Now, as usual, Peregrine saw behind the tunicle of the eyes the strange interweaving of nerves and veins which pierced deep into the brain, but with these were twined bright silver threads, a hundred times thinner than the thinnest spider's web, and it was these very threads that confused him, for they seemed to be endless, branching out into a something indistinguishable even by the microscopic eye. Perhaps they were thoughts of a sublimer kind the others of a sort more easily comprehended. Then he observed flowers, strangely blended, which took the shape of men. Then again men, who dissolved, as it were, into the earth, and peeped forth again as stones and metals. Amongst these all manner of beasts were in motion, who underwent innumerable changes, and spoke strange languages. No one appearance answered to the other, and in the plaintive sounds of sorrow that filled the air there was a dissonance corresponding with that of the images. It was this very dissonance that ennobled still more the deep fundamental harmony which broke out triumphantly and united all that seemed irreconcilable. "'Do not puzzle yourself,' whispered Master Flea. "'Do not puzzle yourself, my good peregrine.' Those which you see are the images of a dream. Even if anything more should lurk behind them, now is not the time for further inquiry. Only call the little deceiver by her real name, and then sift her as much as you please. As the lady had many names, it must have been difficult, one would have thought, for Peregrine to hit upon the right. But, without the least reflection, he exclaimed, Dorcha Elverdink, dear, charming girl, was it no deceit? Is it possible that you can love me? Immediately the little one awoke from her dreamy state, opened her eye, and said with burning glance, What a doubt, my peregrine! 
could a maiden do as i have done unless her breast were filled with the most glowing passion peregrine i love you more than any one and if you will be mine i am yours with my whole soul and remain with you because i cannot leave you and not merely to escape from the tyranny of my uncle the silver threads had disappeared and the thoughts properly arranged ran thus how is this at first i feigned a passion for him only to regain master flea for myself and life and hook and now i actually am fond of him i have caught myself in my own snares i think no more of master flea and would like to be his who seems lovelier to me than any man i have ever seen it may be easily supposed what effect these thoughts produced in peregrine's breast he fell on his knees before the fair one covered her hand with a thousand burning kisses called her his joy his heaven his whole happiness well said the maiden drawing him gently to her side well my love you certainly will not deny a request on the fulfilment of which depends the repose nay the very existence of your beloved demand replied peregrine tenderly embracing her demand anything my life anything you will your slightest wish is my command nothing in the world is so dear to me that i would not with pleasure sacrifice it to you and your affection woe is me said master flea who could have imagined that the little traitress would have conquered i am lost here then replied gamaheh after having returned with equal fire the glowing kisses which peregrine imprinted on her lips the door burst open and in rushed george pepusch sir harriet cried the little one in despair and fell back on the sofa senseless the thistle zeherit flew to the princess took her in his arms and ran off with the speed of lightning for the time being master flea was saved end of adventure four part two